Um, this evening we are joined by Sandy Rose, um, who has been on DSO as long as I can remember, um, and is very vocal um, on the platform. And I'm really, really thrilled to sit down and chat with her. So thank you so much for joining me this evening. My pleasure. It's great to be here. <laughs> um, so why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, I have a bit of a diverse background. I've been doing mostly bankruptcy work for majority of my career. Um, what that entails is I do a lot of interim management. So when a company's in bankruptcy and there's a trustee appointed, for example, I go in um, if the company is something we can operate and I sort of act as like interim management, having to assess whether we can even keep the company open and things like that. And I do a lot of with that forensic accounting and financial work, budgeting and things like that. And then about three, almost four years ago and now I started getting involved with um, blockchain and crypto startups just because they kind of came across my desk and I would read their white papers and think they were terrible and I didn't care so I would tell people why I thought they were terrible and it was because they were primarily lacking a business purpose. And so that sort of translated into people saying, hey, you want to come and be a part of our projects and help us with that arm of it. So. I sort of learned quite a bit about the blockchain and crypto space through all of those endeavors. That's pretty much the gist okay. of my background. All right. So it's been three years now. Yeah, it was early 2018. So you so said it's three years, four years well. now. Yeah, it's close to four years now, I guess, in the crypto space. Okay. So uh, it was during this that you came across, I mean, DSO is one of these oh. projects or how? No, so that's separate. So it's early 2000. Like this year, 21, um, I started, the, I got into Clubhouse because my sister and I were working on a project sort of in the NFT space. And so that was kind of the place to be involved in those discussions and to learn about it and things like that. So about a month after I was there, somebody that I was following on Instagram that I knew from Clubhouse had posted, I don't know, it was like the middle of the night, my time, but they had posted about BitCloud and I didn't know what it was, but I had this moment of FOMO. And so I joined and it was I guess it was March 24th and so I think the password had been removed but I couldn't get on from my computer and so I tried on my phone through Google and it let me in and at the time again I didn't know password versus no password but I was I thought I had hit like the you know the mother load and somehow I've gotten in where nobody else did <laughs> special uh, fast forward I was not but once I got on, I then jumped onto Clubhouse and there was rooms of people talking about it, you know, that it was a scam or that it was cool or whatever. I didn't, you know, at that point I didn't really care. And so that's, I got on because of FOMO. Fear of FOMO. I think, <laughs> I think we <laughs> yes. all, we all FOMO'd in the beginning a lot with it. Yes. Um, uh, and what was, what's your, what was your first impression of it versus now and has it changed or? Well, I, when I first got on, I didn't know what I was even looking at or what it was for, right? Nobody knew. So, I mean, the interface was terrible. Um, I didn't think it was a scam for a bunch of different reasons, but, um, you know, I just, I didn't really know what the point of it was. And when I first opened an account, so sort of by way of backstory, um, I've never been on social media sort of as my own persona. With Twitter, I had always been using it for business purposes and on Instagram, my dogs are sort of like dealist celebrities. And so I sort of managed their account and everything I did was sort of in the voice of the dog. It sounds crazy, but so I just assumed that, you know, when I got onto BitCloud, I didn't know that it was sort of more Twitter than it was Instagram. And so I first opened an account for my dog, Kiko. And within a couple of days, I kind of realized, and sort of at the same time, I was in all these clubhouse rooms where we were talking about what we would do with it and sort of how it would work and all of these things. And, I was encouraged at that point to open an account in my own name and sort of have my own voice that where I wasn't talking like a dog. <laughs> so I did that and it was cool because my first name belonged, I won't, won't give you the backstory, but it's, it's supposed to be Sandy Rowe is one word and I've never been able to get that handle anywhere. So because BitCloud was brand new, you know, that was available. So that kind of probably pushed me over the hump to actually claim that handle and start talking as myself, which is what I did. And I still have the Kiko account, but I don't use it as much. Um, it's a little bit complicated to gain traction because um, basically you have to like talk to people. And so everyone knows it's me. So for me to talk as though I'm a dog is super awkward and just doesn't work. So mostly I, I talk as myself. 
<laughs> under my Sandy Rose handle. Well, maybe you should just turn Kiko into an NFT series. <laughs> Perhaps, yes, I could do that. I have uh, 10,000 plus pictures of the dogs. I have more than enough content. I think every pet owner does. <laughs> yes. And you have yeah. more reason <laughs> than most. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, what was your strategy to gain followers once you got on and started looking around or? Well, so I didn't have a, I don't, I, I, I still don't have a full strategy for anything related to BitCloud. So um, I've always said I'm kind of day to day because I don't like to put pressure on myself to create content or feel like I owe anybody anything or have a specific brand because it's still weird to think of myself as a brand. So I, I sort of didn't really come into this with any kind of plan. And although I've sort of adopted certain practices, I wouldn't say I have a strategy, but I realized early on that because there's no hashtags um, and the visibility sort of on DSO and both, you know, the platforms is very limited. The only way that people will know you exist is if you talk to them. So I spend most of my time actually going through the feeds, um, typically like the global feed or now on, on diamond uh, clout feed, some of the, the new feeds so I can see people I don't already follow and also my follower feed. But I spend a lot of time, most of my time actually commenting on other people's posts, giving them likes, diamonds, things like that. Um, I also, I only tend to post once or twice a day if that uh, most of my posts are sort of longer in form and more detailed and analytical so i don't have that much content to post regularly but i do spend time i i respond to pretty much everybody that comments on one of my posts so i've said that sort of my method of content creation and it, it was hard for my brain to reconcile this at first but my main method of content creation is by way of conversations in these comment threads and so I think because of that, people are more likely to comment on my post because they know that if they take the time to do that, I'll very likely have a conversation with them. And same thing, you know, people learn about you. If, if they write something, they want to know that they were heard. And so by commenting on their posts, there's some sort of small relationship in that moment that's been formed or that gets perpetuated by people that I comment on regularly. So I think that that is what sort of helped me to build, you know, whatever following that I have. So is that what made you stay, the people that you've encountered or why have you stuck it out? Yeah, it's 100% the people. I mean, I am a bit of a recluse in my regular life. I'm not very social. So the fact that I talk to people all day is, you know, a little contrary to how I view myself, but I've had some really dynamic and interesting and thoughtful conversations. And I've met some amazing people, you know, that I would never have met anywhere else. And so on a daily basis, the value that I get from the platform comes from those interactions. And the fact that people enjoy, like shockingly enjoy my longer posts, um, you know, take the time to read them and comment and have positive feedback. I mean, that's really, for me, where all the value comes from. So I'm, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the platform and the technology and things like that. But for me right now, the time that I've spent and then gotten back because of the relationships that I've formed, for me, it's a win. And I've actually, I've been to a couple of meetups, so I've met people in person as well, which is super cool. Well, that's awesome. Um, so obviously anyone who even has heard of you knows that you don't shy away from uh, voicing concerns or issues or raising mm -hmm. issues. Um, how was that initially received versus how maybe it's received now? Uh, it's I shockingly had a good response even from the beginning. So something I wanted to share is that my early bit clout experience was very much shaped by the time that I spent in Clubhouse because I was in a room. We had a room that was open. We were trying to go for a record, but it was open 24 hours a day. And so I eventually had this little crew that we were in there together at any point in the day and we were onboarding new users. And so those discussions and that sort of think tank environment helped me to form a lot of opinions and views and thoughts about BitCloud and now DSO, but, um, and also sort of put me in touch with real people that were on the platform. I think if I had just showed up and not been in that clubhouse environment, I probably would have gotten bored pretty quickly. And despite my FOMO, I don't know that I would have stuck around, but it's through those comments that I started to form my own opinions and have thoughts. And that's sort of the things that I started to post. So a lot of them are sort of critical, um, not meant to be 
negative necessarily. It's just things that I feel like either people didn't think about and perhaps should, or because now I'm in a lot of different Discord, like off-platform chats between Clubhouse, Telegram, and Discord, I'm hearing people chat about certain things. And a lot of times I, I want to take that and have that go on chain. And so I'll post something about it, I, you know, ideally highlighting the issues and trying to get the dialogue going. So that's kind of the basis for my post. And then it's other things where I think people should maybe be talking about something. Maybe there's things they didn't think about that I want to raise and then also see how they respond. Um, despite the fact that it's somewhat critical in nature, I do really take the time to try and use words that are not divisive. Mm. And so that, because I, I mean, I, if I post something, I think it's important. And so I don't want the message to be received in a way that's not intended or to sort of foster a sort of environment of toxicity. So that's mm. been really important. I, I really try and I hope that it, I mean, occasionally like I'll get annoyed about something and maybe I will be slightly more animated in my language, but that's also part of my personality. And so I do also try and let some of my sarcastic personality come through because I don't want to sort of whitewash myself into, you know, just being not me because I think that people expect that at this point. So I think it's a disservice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I've always appreciated about your posts is when you're highlighting these, they might not even be issues, like you said, they're just yeah. things that perhaps we should be having conversations about. It's always done in a way that is respectful, not being condescending, you know, or uh, ass kissing. <laughs> yes, well, that, um, yeah, you, know, you, very, you, don't, you don't pull your punch. <laughs> yeah, you don't I'm pull your punch, <laughs> which is great. Yeah, I'm you very know, opposed um, to ass kissing. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> um, but, at, but, at, but at the same time, it's, it's, you're, you're not negative, like you said, you're not negative in the sense of that you're trying to create a, a just discontent in the, in the troops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, guys, we need to just look at this. It's very serious or, you know, it could be nothing, but let's have a discussion about it, which I think a lot of people appreciate. And I think the, the, the higher ups also have seen that, you know, it's not just causing um, dissent in the troops <laughs> it's like okay this is conversations we need to talk and engage in because they are serious um how did it lead to the community reps elections i mean uh so i mean like you know we were just talking about a lot of what i do is to try and get the community involved and engaged and sometimes i see things that the core team is doing that I, it seems to me that they are not considering how the community as a whole views it and perceives it and i think that that's important because when people are left to talk amongst themselves that's what sort of breeds discontent right if people mm -hmm. don't have because it's like a, the rumor mill or whatever it is i mean so that's sort of some of the discussions that i try and have is when i i think that there's something the community feels like they want to talk about i try to get them to do that part of that is because a lot of times you know people are new to, to crypto and to a social media space like this and they're perhaps not confident in their opinions because they don't have the background um, but I know that there is maybe some commonality between the way people think. And I think that it's somewhat empowering to know that your views are validated and that you are on the right track with your thinking. So that's another reason why I like to bring conversations on chain. So I was already kind of doing a little bit of sort of bringing the community together and sort of helping to sort of to amplify the collective sentiment on certain issues. So the, so the community rep program was started by two members of the community, um, Darian Parrish and Jason Devlin. And they sort of thought that it would be good to have a group of representatives ideally voted on by a significant portion of the community to, and I think the intent originally was to have them communicate with the core team to sort of do something like what I was doing and aggregate information, you know, figure out what people wanted to talk about and maybe what sort of, um, concerns were not getting amplified or not getting heard by the core team. So they, they sort of took it upon themselves to kick off this process whereby individuals would self-nominate and say, hey, I wanna be, you know, I'd like to be a rep. And then once all of the people self-nominated, they went through an election process. So I never wanted to be a politician. I never wanted to run for school office when I was in high school. That sounds, I don't like self-promotion. So the thought of going through an election made me just, you know, want to go into hiding. But because I sort of already had that voice, I thought that it would be something that I should try out. So I decided to to run for that position and we went through the process and I was elected. 
Um, there have been concerns about the way the process was carried out, either that not enough people knew about it or that the voting mechanism didn't work. I understand all those concerns, but this is, a, you know, for black, it's sort of a made up thing. And so the core team hasn't acknowledged yet. So it doesn't have any official weight. And so for my purposes, I look at it like an experiment, right? This is something eventually we should want to do. And so I think doing it now, at least getting the process started to see what works and what doesn't in itself is a valuable exercise, even if we don't really carry anything out. So this was about, I wanna say about a month ago when the process finished. Um, originally they were going to elect five representatives. They ended up going with seven because the six and seven spots were only distinguishable by maybe one or two votes. And so to avoid any issue of a recount and things like that, and where the voting mechanism had some issues, they decided to include all seven. So we have been communicating, um, we set up a Discord server. The seven of us are in there. We have our own channel that we speak in and nobody else can post in, but that's open for everyone to see what we're talking about so that it can be transparent. It's been a bit of a challenge to sort of even get on the same page about what our purpose is because we have, so we haven't expressly reached out to the core team, but they also haven't said, hey, we knew this was going on or acknowledged any of it. So it's unclear um, about whether this is something they would even want to be participating in. So with that in mind, it becomes a little bit difficult to conceptualize what our purpose is and what we think we could do. So a lot of the time we've spent so far has been on sort of that discussion. So I would say things haven't really moved forward that much, um, but we did have a clubhouse room last weekend because we sort of discovered that we we communicate much better in a voice chat and sort of as our first mandate we decided that we need to come up with some feedback mechanism where people can post questions concerns whatever information we're trying to gather and then we can figure out the best mechanism from there to, to deal with a vote if that's what we need to do um, so we're sort of in that process i think the first direction we're going to go is people want to have it on chain so we'll probably do it through the community rep, which is, by the way, now called the diesel voices. We wanted to change sort of the perception a little mm -hmm. bit of what our, our job was. Um, and so I think the first thing we'll be, we'll be posting something through the diesel voices, um, BitCloud account and diesel account, I guess, and just seeing how it goes as a, a bit of a test case. Mm. So okay. that's where we are with that. All right. Um, what other projects are you involved in? around the DSO space, I, I suppose, or the crypto space, because a lot yeah. of creators are also going off platform with NFTs and other areas and things like that. Yeah, so NFTs, besides the fact that I had this project with my sister, especially on Bitcoin, NFTs are not my thing. Um, I don't, I mean, I love art in general. I've studied art. I, I don't pay for art. That's just another, never been something that I've spent my money on. And, and I'm not into the speculative nature of NFTs. In general, I do like hold some crypto, but I'm not a trader because I know that trading would make me insane because I'd be constantly worried about the prices and, and having to assess whether I was making good investments. So I just know that's not my thing. And to preserve my own sanity, I don't get involved with those sorts of things. So on DSO and even in the greater crypto space, I don't, I'm not an NFT buyer. Um, and I'm not really like, I'm not a developer. So I spend a lot of time because of my business experience. I actually chat with a lot of developer type people from the DSO community. Cause I know a lot of them have good ideas, but maybe don't understand the business implications or what they should be thinking about. So I've always sort of put out there that I'm happy to have discussions with them right now. I'm charging the very, very low price of free. So I'm a very good deal. <laughs> I talk. <laughs> I talk to a lot of people and that's interesting because I think that the most important thing that can happen is not the onboarding of users now, it's the development of platforms that eventually will bring users because the platforms mm -hmm. appeal to and attract a, a, a much wider user base than any of the existing platforms um, can bring in now. So that's really been my focus. I recently started a project with someone on the platform, his name is Meeks. Um, he's an author, so I can't give too much information because it's it's going to be a really large project. Only a part of it right now will be on DSO, um, but it's something that we have been collaborating on and it's in the works. So everyone must watch this space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And anything else? I mean, I know, uh, I know that you're an advisory role to the creator initiative. 
we ask a lot of advice yes. from you. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I found out about it. I think I jumped into a clubhouse room one day, maybe when it was your first, probably your second session. And then since then, you know, I've been sharing with you my views about different things. I mean, I have a slightly different view than some women about sort of the women in the space, but it's been a great project. And I think you're doing amazing things with it. I'm highly impressed with how professional your videos are and how much time you put into it and the direction that they take. So, you know, I've always been happy to be a part of it. Well, thank you. It's all Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there was another thing I wanted to possibly put in create the creator coin. Oh, um, yeah. I, you... <laughs> I don't have a ton of great things to say about creator coins, not the concept of creator coins. I think there's a lot of value and there's things that can be done. I've just seen how they don't really work on the platform. And it's because, you know, when we first got on back in March, everyone, the, the collective sentiment was buy your own coin because then you could profit off yourself which everybody did, I hold eight of my own coin, but it kind of became apparent pretty early on that that was a bit of a problem and it presents a bit of a conflict of interest because when you sell any of your own coin, ideally to capitalize on any success you've had, you're lowering the price for all of the other coin holders. And so in general, mm -hmm. that sort of issue has been seen as a negative. And back when people first started seeing that happening, they were very upset and there was a lot of people screaming and actually crying in clubhouse and calling people scammers and rug pullers. And, you know, so I sort of realized some of the utility of the way the system is now is very complex and, and it's, there's so much human emotion involved in it that I don't think that it can function the way that it was intended. And even more than that, I mean, my issue with creator coins is that they're incredibly volatile because really you're reliant on, for the most part, one person. And I've seen a lot of people have great intentions about their accounts and their projects and things like that. But for various reasons, either they become disillusioned with the platform or real life gets in the way, they have to sort of abandon those projects. Or maybe they get upset about something. But like in my bankruptcy work, I've never seen a company that just overnight decides that they don't want to keep operating. Like, like that doesn't happen. But on, on DSO, someone could have a really terrible day and sell all their coins and leave the platform and make emotional decisions. And you know, so for that reason, they're just highly volatile. And so I buy a few here and there, but for the most part, I basically stopped buying creator coins pretty early on. Part of that is because I'm risk averse. And the other thing is I just didn't see them paying off for me. I think unless you're a day trader and you're getting in early and you know people are going to buy a coin and you're okay selling it pretty quickly, you know, sort of the, the hodling route is, is a, a risky one because you're running the risk that someone's not going to stick around, which is a, a pretty high risk based on what we see from daily active users, even those that are best intentioned. Would you have any suggestions with regards to things that could make it less unstable? Um, or, I mean, it, it, would it, I, I don't know enough about crypto, but could you not, could we not put in like a floor? Floor, not a floor. Yeah, yeah. There's a floor. Yes. No, yeah. we want a floor. Yes, there's a floor. So I mean, it's, sort of it's from the initial investment, but I also want to invest in my own coin because I see it as a success and I want to be able yes. to use it. But if I need to sell my coin to do something like buy a laptop, yeah, I don't want to cripple my coin price as well as screw over my investors. I mean, what would, do you have any suggestions that they could look at? Or it's just a conversation, like. Yeah, so actually this was something, so again, like I don't love creator coins, but this was like Darian Parrish, who also had started the community reps program, had reached out to me maybe a, a month or two ago. I have no concept of time, so I don't know when it was, but about sort of putting together a bit of a, a best practices for creator coins. So I think, you know, we, we sort of boiled it down to, for example, if you want to sell your coin, try and do it in a way that you're not selling a lot at one time, let people know you're selling it. Now that's a little complicated because if you let people know you're selling it, you might get people who then sell your coin. And then when you go to sell it, it's worth less and you get less and then maybe you can't buy your laptop. So that's, mm. that's, you know, that's potentially a problem. Having more of a free market um, mechanism would certainly help where you could trade your coins. And I know a little bit of that goes on sort of behind the scenes over the counter on Discord. Um, it's a little complicated because I think it's sort of done manually where you have to trust that if you send someone your coin, you know, they're going to send you either their coin or some DSO back, but that's one way to do it. I mean, I'd love to see more of a free market or a marketplace 
environment where that if you wanted to get rid of your coin, you had to sell it, but sell it to somebody who wanted to buy it. Because think about like right now, if you need money, you know, from your house, like if your house appreciates, you're not actually gaining anything on it until you sell it. Right. Well, there's no cash flow. There's no other way in which you can realize actual cash besides having mm -hmm. a buyer for this for something you want to sell. The problem with trader coins is that you can sell them in because of the bonding curve, you can just sell them mm -hmm. into oblivion effectively with, with no consequence aside from people get mad at you. So if you have an asset you want to sell, it sort of stands to reason you should have to have a buyer for it, which would mitigate some of the issues. So either if that could be built in or if there was somebody who built a platform to do that, I think that would help um, because then it wouldn't reduce the price because the same amount of coins would be in circulation. And staking? So, I mean, staking would help. Staking also help? Well, it, it would help with the rug pulled in terms of the accounts that set up with the intention of just letting people buy the coin and then selling out whatever they bought. So it would help that. Um, I'm kind of on the fence about staking because I still think that if someone needs their coin, they should be able to sell it. And that would sort of mm. prevent that from happening. But it would, it would keep things a little bit more on an even keel in terms of amounts that could be sold at any given time. I mean, that are the, one of the issues is that there's so few users, each creator coin for the most part has very few in circulation. So any buy or sell of that coin has pretty big price consequences up and down. So, you mm -hmm. know, if there were more, you know, as, as we had a wider user base and there were more coins in circulation, the sale of a few coins would not have the impact that it does now. So that's maybe a function of the platform still being early. Um, I think the bonding curve, the shape of it could be flattened a little bit so that it wasn't such a dynamic change with buys and sells and things like that. Um, you know, we could go on about this speculating all day, uh, <laughs> kind of where I'm at with well, that a little bit. But. Yeah, well, I'm learning, so <laughs> it's nice to yeah. um, What advice would you have liked to receive before you join DSO from this, stand, this side of it? <laughs> I don't know that because I was on so early, I feel like we all kind of figured it out together. So I don't know that there's any advice that I, I can't even really remember before I joined. But for new creators, I there's two things. I mean, when people are onboarding, I really want them to be realistic about managing the expectations of new creators. If you promise somebody fame and fortune, they're going to be disappointed because it's not something that just naturally comes just because you can monetize your content. You know, I, I still think, like I said, the best part of this is the community. And so if you can come in looking to that angle, you can get a lot of out of it. And then whatever else kind of happens, happens. And, you know, you kind of ride the wave with it. I think it's important that new creators understand right now the time commitment that they have to put in in order to build a following and to be seen. And that it's not just a matter of you can just post things to your account and hope everybody sees it and loves it. You really have to do sort of the legwork of engaging mm -hmm. and interacting with others. So I think that yeah, that's absolutely. sort of an important thing. So if I was just joining now, that's something that I would want someone to tell me because it would be very difficult, I think, to sort of see any success at all without that. Even, you know, I see people, cause I, I spend a lot of time in my notifications and I see who follows me and I check out their accounts to see what they're doing. And there's a lot of people who come on as NFT artists and all they do is post their art. You know, they think that it's like a marketplace like OpenSea and probably no one's mm. going to see it. People aren't going to believe that, you know, there's all these scams and things. So that com complicates things, but they're just really not going to have much success because no one's going to know they exist and no one's going to form any sort of relationship with them or their art unless they're interacting with others, ideally sharing mm. something about themselves and not just posting a bunch of NFTs without any sort of context or content. Yeah, I, I also find even, even, some accounts that just it's just reclass. Oh yes, I I don't I don't follow. I, I follow everybody. Those I don't really follow because I'm like I don't need to see that. Yeah, and it, it's just it's sad because at the end of the day they're they're failing to share their voice. I mean, you can support, and I I still feel that there should be a way to like filter <laughs> in yes. profile. If I go to somebody's profile. And I can select, I want to just look at their content versus what they've reposted. Oh yeah, that would you know, be a great feature. Yeah. I, I really think if we could be able to do that, even on my own, like I want to share more, but at the same time, I, I look at other ones and you scroll through thousands of, and you're like, okay, so who is this person? 
yeah. what do they stand for or where's their arts you know um so i i always think it's important to post your voice yes i um, i agree i i um i don't i think people maybe feel like i'm not supportive and i hope that that's never the case but i really don't repost very much content unless it's something i really believe in and that i can add something to so i i don't know if i've ever even just straight reposted something i always use the quote repost so that i can add something to the discussion i also know that for me when i'm looking through the feeds my brain sort of just disassociates with any content that's just a straight repost but if somebody has quote reposted it i my brain sees it and i'm more likely to read you know both mm -hmm. their their commentary on it as well as the original post because that that's adding value right i mean if you see something you connected with it i, I want you to tell me why you bothered to share it i don't mm. want you just to reshare something and so again same thing with, like, with my content i because i don't post that often i don't ever want someone to look at my feed and wonder what my deal is right like i want them to see my post so that's mm. another reason why i tend to not repost that much because i want sort of my content to be at the forefront of of um, my profile yeah absolutely um if people want to find you on other socials where can they find you um well i'm so i'm on twitter now i don't know why people on DSO told me to go on there i guess they're promoting DSO on twitter so i would say all of my followers like 95 percent are from DSO. so i don't know if that's a ton of value to anybody um but i'm sandy rose on there but the o is a zero because that was what i could get and then um, I do also have an Instagram that I wasn't really using that I started using again, posting some photography too, because back in the early days of Clubhouse, you had no way to direct message anybody. So everybody was connecting through Instagram. So on there, I am just Sandy Rose, I think. And then really sort of the crux of my social media life has been the dogs. So if you're into very cute dogs, <laughs> you can follow Kiko's account. I was about to say, don't forget to just don't forget their socials. <laughs> yeah, except it's it's a terrible name. And, you know, I, I opened the account like seven or eight years ago. Now it's Kiko the Little Frenchie with underscores under each um, word. So it's a, it's as a handle okay. for marketing purposes. It's terrible, but <laughs> that's what it is. And I don't use it as much. I mean, years ago, it kind of got stuck up in the algorithm when it changed. So the engagement dropped a little bit. And it's just it's a lot of work to take pictures of dogs. Uh, so yeah i don't i mostly post stories and i post things i i rep a few different brands still because the dogs i get free stuff and so i post what they send me but that's and also because my mom gets her news about her grand dogs from my instagram story so that's that's Absolutely. what i'm using it for Absolutely. mostly yeah i know how hard it is to make dogs sit still i, I had I yeah. have two small ones well kiko is very good still. Kiko was always very good because she learned she's very treat driven. And so she learned early on that if she sat for a camera or a photo, she would get a treat. And so it became the point where if you were holding your phone near her, she thought you were taking a picture and she would pose, even if you were just on your phone. <laughs> so out of all four of them, she will do anything for a treat. And so she will sit there as long as she needs to. But then she gets the problem is with the other ones, she knows that they're around. And so she's like looking around to see if they're going to steal her treat. So. <laughs> That's that's the yeah. Oh, um, we'll <laughs> drop all the links to, uh, for all your socials in okay, the description perfect. of the video. So, all right. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, is there anything else you'd like to chat? I know it's evening here, but it's midday for you. Is there um, anything yeah. else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up? Are you no, good? I think that was a, that was a great conversation. I appreciate all your time, and those are great questions. Well, thank so you so much for having for me. The time out to chat us. All right.